Over the last year, nearly two in five adult New Yorkers have experienced at least one of the symptoms of food insecurity, and a little more than half of adults worry they might be unable to pay for their next grocery bill if faced with an unexpected expense of $500 or more, according to a new survey released by No Kid Hungry. For more on the survey results and how state policymakers should respond, we're joined by Rachel Sabella, director of No Kid Hungry New York. Welcome back to the show, Rachel. Thanks for having me, David. So for some New Yorkers, these survey results are not going to be a surprise since they're emblematic of the challenges in their day-to-day lives. But for others, I imagine this may be new news to them. So for those New Yorkers who are fortunate enough not to deal with food insecurity, can you put into context some of the results from your survey, which also found that about two-thirds of respondents reported feeling stress, anxiety, or depression because of the struggle to afford food? Absolutely. No Kid Hungry recently partnered with Change Research to take a survey, statewide survey of New Yorkers, really to get a better understanding of their experiences with hunger, with food insecurity, with accessing programs. I have been an advocate for 15 years. I have been working on anti-hunger issues for nearly 10 years. And I have to tell you what we saw in this survey was absolutely devastating. As you said, we found that 73% of New Yorkers are finding it harder to buy groceries, whether it's because of inflation costs, whether it is because they are still dealing with job loss or being unemployed in the pandemic, or really an expiration of programs um, that had come out to help people put food on the table. Families are facing a tough time. And I think the other thing that we saw in this poll is that this is not a problem that's concentrated in one area, whether it is a rural, suburban, urban area, downstate, upstate, the hunger crisis is everywhere. You mentioned working in this space for longer than a decade now. So were these results a surprise to you or were they expected based on policy decisions and the economic landscape right now? Unfortunately, I wasn't surprised by these results, but I think when you see these numbers in writing, when you see people explaining how, you know, not being able to afford food or have regular access to food, what it's doing to them to cause increased experiences of anxiety, of depression, it's devastating. I think, you know, we also knew over the last few months, some of the pandemic era programs that really helped put help families put food on the table, whether it was the expanded federal child tax credit that expired or the SNAP emergency allotments, which gave SNAP recipients an additional grocery benefit, um, those came to an end as well. So families already stretched budgets were really being hit in several ways. And I think it really shows with these findings. You mentioned the change to SNAP. What was that in terms of a dollar amount? What were people potentially losing uh, in terms of support that they got to purchase groceries? For every SNAP recipient, they lost approximately $90 per month with SNAP emergency allotments. This was something that the federal government passed early in the pandemic to make sure people had those additional grocery benefits. So when you think about that, to lose almost $100 per person, if it's a household of four people, $400 in grocery benefits, what does that do? That means you're buying less food. That could mean that you're buying less nutritious food because it's cheaper. It may mean that you're putting more food on your child's plate and the caregiver is eating less. So it's really hitting them in so many ways when costs are going up, whether it's for rent, for gas, for electricity bills, families are struggling. And those, the expiration of those additional dollars has had a real damaging effect. Well, I want to turn to the policy solutions that you think could address some of the problems highlighted by this survey. And I want to start because we're talking uh, just a few hours after the budget was uh, adopted about policies that make a difference and were actually in uh, the state budget. So is there any good news uh, from your perspective in the state's uh, newly adopted budget? 
I'm pleased to say that we have some good news in the state budget. I want to say that a lot of this, though, is also first steps in the process. So number one is there was an inclusion of $134 million in new funds to expand no-cost school breakfast and school lunch to school districts across the state. For many families, we know that while they may not qualify for free and reduced price meals, they may miss qualifying by $200. That's not a lot of money in a budget to then make up for those meal costs. This is going to allow the state to then make sure working families, struggling families will be able to, for their children to get those no cost meals for breakfast and lunch. We still have to see how some of this will play out. You know, next steps in this process is really the state education department working on regulations, working with school districts. So we're still a ways off, but I think this was a huge step. I think the other first step we saw in this budget that I want to applaud was the expansion of the Empire State Child Tax Credit. Thanks to this agreement in the state budget, and I really commend the legislature for pushing for this, but the state's version of the child tax credit will now be available to children under the age of four, which is going to add um, and benefit about 900,000 kids across the state. Of Prior to this, of all the states that had their own version of the child tax credit, New York was the only one that actually exempted the youngest children from this. So we're really glad this has been corrected. In both cases, there's more to be done. We want to see that there are no cost school meals available to every child in the state. We want to see many of these tax credits expanded. But I think this was a first and important step forward. Yeah, I want to unpack the funding for school meals because we covered this issue prior to the adoption of the budget and the amount that we heard bandied around was $200 million to achieve universal access. So does a commitment of $134 million mean that access to school lunches is going to be means tested in some way, like for low and middle income families pri primarily based on the language you were using earlier? I think at this point, we still are waiting to see what this will mean. Um, and really, the state education department, working with some of the federal agencies, um, will determine if this is going to go to specifically to families. It appears this will be going to schools and school districts, um, but we're still waiting for more to come out and to learn about the process. Early in the budget process, we spoke with uh, Dan Egan of Feeding New York State, and one of the things that he was particularly concerned about was the funding proposed by the governor for the Hunger Prevention and Nutrition Assistance Program, known colloquially as HIPNAP, uh, which supplements SNAP benefits, essentially. Uh, basically, the governor's funding level was below what was in last year's budget, how did things shake out for HIPNAP in the final budget? Has it been restored to last year's levels? Is it going above and beyond given the scope of the problem? What's it look like? It was great to see that the final budget included an increase for HIPNAP funding. You know, HIPNAP is able to provide food and resources to food banks, to food pantries and soup kitchens across the state of New York. We know that those emergency food providers have been on the front lines of this pandemic since day one. We know many of those agencies now are seeing a tremendous influx of clients, whether it's because people who SNAP benefits are not sufficient enough for their families, but we also know that they are providing food and resources to asylum seekers that are arriving in New York. So additional funds is important for this, but we also know that more funds are needed for these organizations to keep their programs running and to have enough food for every client that arrives at their doors. You mentioned the child tax credit as a policy, while not directly connected to purchasing food, as something that puts money in people's pockets and therefore gives you more flexibility when it's time to buy groceries. In that same vein, we heard from a lot of advocates in the issue of affordability that the governor's plan to address the housing stock and potentially 
make housing more affordable would make a real difference in terms of the people's ability to purchase groceries. The fact that the governor's so-called housing compact didn't make it into the budget, is that something that you're concerned about on the affordability front when it comes to food? Or was this not really something you were thinking about? I think it's really important that any program that helps struggling New Yorkers, New Yorkers that are living in poverty, New Yorkers that are facing food insecurity, that helps to give them the resources are prioritized in this budget and that we're looking for those solutions. We know that when a family's budget is stretched, their rent is a set cost. They can't just decide not to pay rent that much. They could potentially lose their apartment. You know, we heard from families in this poll that in some cases they had the choice between paying their electric bill or buying food for their children, and they had to keep the lights on. So they paid their electric bill. Um, So we know all of these programs are interchangeable, and it's really important that we come together with a holistic solution um, to help struggling families keep the lights on, keep food on the table. If you had to put a dollar amount on what it would take to address the food insecurity that exists right now in New York, what are we talking about? Is this millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars annually if we were just to subsidize the food needs of New Yorkers? I mean, how should we think about this problem? Because When we think about a $229 billion budget, if you're going to tell me the answer is $2 billion, that means with only 1% of the state budget, we can ensure that people aren't going hungry, and maybe that's worth it. So what's the dollar amount you think about? I don't necessarily have a dollar amount that I could call on this answer. I think one of the challenges is, you know, needs fluctuate and benefits levels change and I think the issue of hunger and food insecurity is not always something that people understand. You know, if somebody is facing food insecurity, it may mean they had to skip a meal in order for their children to eat. It meant that they bought less food. And I don't know if everybody that is facing those situations recognizes that that's really what food insecurity is. You know, I don't think that there's not a one size fits all solution to the hunger crisis. And I think it's also bigger. It's connected to those facing poverty. So when we put resources in that are addressing minimum wage, that are addressing housing, when we are making sure that people can apply for all of the tax credits that they are eligible for, when we are strengthening safety net programs, whether it's protecting SNAP from some terrifying proposals at the federal level, expanding tax credits, school meals, you know, there isn't a one size fits all solution. And we need to be looking at all of these programs as ways to address the hunger crisis. Well, we've been speaking with Rachel Sabella. She's the director of No Kid Hungry New York. Rachel, thank you so much for making the time and good luck with the advocacy moving forward. Thank you so much, David. And for more Capital Press Room content, visit capitalpressroom.org or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. And if you listen to us from an Apple device, make sure to leave us a rating and a review so it helps other people find the show. Support for the Capital Press Room provided by the independent power producers of New York. IPNY's annual Clean Energy Spring Conference and Showcase is set for May 9th and 10th at the Albany Capital Center. More information at IPPNY.org.